Hi, and welcome back to Chapter 6 of the audiobook for Pirates of Savannah. Please remember, if you want to support me, you could actually buy the book or buy the commercial-free version of the audio at lupolink, L-A-N-K, lupolink.com. This is author Taryn Lupo, and thanks for listening to Chapter 6. Please remember, you can get a ton of other stuff, including videos, and you can even download the ebook all for free at www.piratesofsavannahbook.com. That's piratesofsavannahbook.com. You can also now get all these audios over at Podomatic, or you can even subscribe at the iTunes store. Please remember that I am putting this all out there for free in hopes that some people will appreciate the product and donate. Feel free to donate at that website, and if you're broke, I understand. Don't worry about donating, just help me out and share it. I'd love more people to hear this. Thank you. <laughs> Chapter 6, A New Life Patrick was greeted by a pair of women and a pair of boys sitting around a stone table. The older woman was wearing a sky-blue dress tied from the waist to the chest, Despite the oppressive heat, every inch of her was covered except her face. The younger woman could have not been more than fifteen. She had a young skin and was wearing a shorter yellow dress. Her exposed forearms and hands were covered with red mosquito welts. The two boys were dressed in matching tricorn hats, simple black vest, and buckle shoes. Finally, Archibald announced, this fine man is the indenture we had been planning on taking on. The family sitting around this table sprung to their feet and cheered. Patrick was taken back by this display of appreciation and could not find his tongue. Archibald continued with the introductions. This is my wife, Marion, my daughter, Heather, and my twin sons, Maximilian and Amos. Turning to his wife, Archibald asked cheerfully, What's for dinner, Mrs. Freeman? Our new friend must be starving. Mr. Freeman, we are dining on a bucket of crabs your two men, Maximilian and Amos, caught this morning in their traps. Marion replied in a formal tone. Well done, lads. Their father beamed with pride and asked, Where did you trap them? Amos replied, A short skirmish south of the palisade, off a small outcrop where the large rotted palmetto tree is. <laughs> the father picked up a snapping crab and chased his boys with it, saying, Shall we eat them raw or introduce them to the kettle pot? The family laughed at the scene of the giggling boys running in circles around the stone table, just barely escaping the pinch of an angry crustacean. All oh, right, I forgot my manners, Archibald stated, ending the chase. Wife, be a dandy and cook these crabs while I'll show this Jasper to his quarters. Uh, nice to meet such a lovely family, Patrick said humbly as he departed, smiling at Heather. Patrick followed Archibald to the shed. It was tight quarters, and there was not one bit of space wasted. A hammock was attached to the walls. Under that, boxes of metal scraps. There was a workbench full of tools, strange contraptions hanging from the rafters, and a small window mostly blocked out by even more tools. The shooters are positioned on the north side of town, against the Palisades currently, but they'll be moved again shortly, Archibald instructed. You can always shit just outside the palisades in the swamp. Nobody's be up in arms about it. Just bring a bucket of water and a sponge with you. It's hard to find foliage to clean your backside that won't redden your ass skin. It seems everything green is poisonous out there. Archibald continued as Patrick tried to catch every word he said. Water's abundant everywhere. You can get water out of the rivers, but it's best from any of the streams around, Archibald explained. I've had a very long journey, but I'm ready to work if you like, Patrick stated eagerly. No, not tonight. Tonight we get to know you and determine if we wasted all the family's gold coin or not. Shall we have some grog before dinner and watch the sun slowly retire, Mr. Willis? Mr. Freeman grinned. Patrick sighed happily. Yes, sir. That'd be dandy good. Both men sat down on the stumps in the yard staring at the sky. Archibald called for Heather to fetch him drinks, and both men began to relax, getting to know each other better. 
Archibald removed his tricorn hat, revealing his white curly wig. Patrick suspected he shaved his head like most men to avoid lice and wearing a wig to stay stylish. As Archibald scratched at the wig in the warm savanna heat, he asked very seriously, Tell me, Patrick, how did you venture up here in Savannah, truthfully? Patrick anguished. Should he tell the truth or do as Mr. Mandrick instructed and omit the prison section of his tale? He drew his breath and spoke. Well, my father was a prominent jeweler in London, and I studied the craft. I took to the skill fast and made my father proud. Bad fortune fell on our family, and he had become a lunger. Patrick embellished a little bit. After he died, I decided to earn my fortune in the new world with hope of sending for my family one day. Heather appeared smiling with two wooden mugs of grog. She made a polite bow and handed the first cup to her father and then repeated the action for Patrick. So did you take a bride back in London, Patrick? Her father shot daggers out of his eyes at the girl. He fumbled. Mm, no, ma'am, I never took a woman. I mean a bride. I mean, I've never been sealed in nuptials with a woman. Not that I mean I took nuptials with a man. He hemmed and hawed. I mean, um, I never had the chance to, um... Archibald rescued the floundering man. I think he means he's still trying to meet the right lady. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Patrick agreed quickly, adding, That is true what he be saying. <laughs> Heather laughed at Patrick's awkwardness and strolled slowly back inside the house. Well, Patrick, let me tell you what you'll be doing the next few years. Archibald went back to his instructions and his grog. I'm a blacksmith, if you could not tell by my bib. I make a fortune mainly making nails, horseshoes, and tools. Times are demanding more of me lately, and I cannot keep true to the demand. So I'm hopeful you will take to the iron as well as you take to silver, and help me stay level with said production. The wig man queried, Do you think you can adapt your skill with your hands? Patrick nodded in agreement as he guzzled his grog. Archibald continued, It is pretty simple and very repetitive. The real silver to be made is in gunshot and rifles. The king's forces constantly demand shot. They drop their casting equipment off for the day, and we custom make shot for their rifle. The Redcoats keep very careful watch that the colonists don't make too many guns for themselves. Or they'll just simply confiscate them from us non-military locals. If you plan on getting your own rifle soon, you'd be careful to keep it hidden until you go hunting. It's best not to tempt those red demons. I can't even fathom being able to afford my own firearm. I was a fine shot with a sling in my boyhood, Patrick joked. These days, I cannot even afford a rock to throw. Marion interrupted them announcing that dinner was now ready. She insisted that the family dine outside because she did not want her home to reek of crab and low tide, so the family gathered in the backyard under the dogwood tree. The tree was in an unusual second yellow bloom and provided refuge from the sweltering sunlight. The shade extended over one large stump that was surrounded by eight logs sitting upright. The family sat on makeshift wood seats and dropped the cooked crabs on a large stump table from a steaming pot. To add to the feast, Heather set out some fresh cornbread, presented in a small basket and wrapped with a cloth napkin to protect it from the clouds of flies. Sitting down around the great stump covered with boiled crab, the family started giggling as Archie Ball cheerfully counted. One, two, three! The family playfully grabbed at the food as fast as hungry orphans and competed for slices of the cornbread. Boisterous laughing ensued as Marion and Amos played tug-of-war with a crab until it broke in two. Such a ridiculous and vulgar display of manners only increased the family's joy and laughter. Patrick was taken back by this odd display. No prayer was said, no proper rotation of hierarchical serving was observed, just chaos. He sat there with a stunned look on his face as a family grabbed for crabs. Maximilian smiled, presenting Patrick with a crab and a large piece of yellow bread. 
I'm faster than my father, the twin said slyly. Here, take these. Patrick laughed loudly and dove into the cornbread, smearing it into his beard. The family chuckled as the smashing sounds of crab shells and wooden hammers echoed in the air. Much laughter was heard from the dogwood for the rest of the evening as the libations continued to flow. Later in the evening, Archibald led Patrick to his hammock in the moonlight and bragged, Be ready for a tour of Savannah tomorrow. I want to show you off. Patrick slowly mounted his hammock clumsily. Months on a ship, and I still can't figure these damn contraptions out. Patrick confessed with a grin as the two men laughed warmly. You will, Archibald promised. You can get rest during second sleep until the seasons change. As with most cultures around the world, the night was split into first and second sleep. This tradition carried over from the old world to the colonies. First sleep was about an hour after dinner until the witching hour of midnight. Second sleep was until midnight to sunrise. The late hours were used for just about anything. Many chores were done as well as hobbies. Many times women knitted or prepared food for the next day's meal. The men completed chores that were too difficult to do in the day's heat, like late night wood chopping or hauling. In the Freeman house, it was also a great time to read, and they burned through barrels of whale oil in their lamps. As Archibald retired to the house, Patrick smiled as he gently swung himself fast asleep in his hammock. A mosquito bite on his nose welcomed Patrick to the waking world. The bite was already welting up. He noticed his hands and face were covered with more bites and angry welts. With an ungraceful maneuver, he fell out of his hammock and onto the pile of scrap metal with a concophonous crash. Maisie had no lacerations from his fall, he considered himself protected by good spirits. Patrick took himself around the back of the shed and made water. The merry libations were now draining his fluids. Although the sun was just rising in the morning sky, the heat already overtook him and he immediately started to sweat through his linen vest. The new blacksmith amused himself by trying to pee on flies in a stagnant puddle. Mr. Freeman soon came around the corner and joined him in the morning urination. We've got to start early around here to avoid the heat. Archibald explained. I want to give you a tour so when I send you to fetch errands you can navigate the town. Let's explore Savannah, or as the rest of the colonies call it, the Scoundrel's Haven. This small swamp town has also been called the Sanctuary for the Bandit, Swindler, Murderer, and Whore. Shall we go explore this convict's paradise? The men walked out into the dirt thoroughfare and started to walk into town. Savannah was set up as a military base. All the lots are about the same size. It's supposed to promote equality, no man better than his neighbors, Archibald smiled. Unless, of course, you're a high-ranking officer. He continued. Oglethorpe knew all about the fire problems in London, so this city is mainly grids and open spaces. This is also smart for defense from the Spanish and the savages. The town pretty much revolves around four main areas called wards. There are also two new wards being developed. Each ward has a central square and is surrounded by trust and tithing lots. The trust lots are for government buildings, churches and such. The tithing lots are used for homes, and each home also gets a lot of five acres at the edge of town. I'll take you around the wards and give you a guide to each. The ward where we live is called Decker Ward. We live on the Strand. The square in the middle is called Market Square, and all the town's commerce comes through here. You'll see the carts of vendors setting up, mainly the African freemen. This colony does not allow slavery. It has the town split. The king's subjects are jealous of all the riches that the Carolinas are now enjoying on the backs of slaves. Other of the majesty's servants find the practice morally appalling. Every year, the people try hard to bend the ear of the trustees that run this town and allow the practice. I fear the trustees are turning sympathetic to the slavers. 
As Archibald cautioned, Patrick nodded. Basically, any kind of food, services, or commerce can be found in this square and ward, and you'll spend most of your hours here. If you go down over there into the tall grass a ways, you'll come to a large crepe myrtle which has been split in two by a lightning bolt. Never seen anything like it. The tree is still alive and growing as two trees now. Ever since that myrtle got burned in two, the townsfolks call that area Thunderbolt. Freeman motioned down a corner to Patrick. Let us turn down to Mr. Thomas Broughton Street until we come to the Derby Ward. It's named after one of those fat cats, the Honorable James the Tenth of Derby. Archibald mocked the pompousness by bowing. Archibald led Patrick down a dusty road to a square that opened in front of them, revealing a large dirt space. The area was busy with activity. Surveyors pulling string between wooden stakes and marking lines. A crew of shirtless and sweaty men were digging a large hole as a group of well-dressed aristocrats and a minister in a black smock and a white wig patted each other's backs and shook each other's hands. Archibald informed Patrick, the Johnson, so named after the generous and well-liked royal governor of South Carolina, was the hub of Anglican activities and a congregation of devout Anglicans was breaking ground to build themselves a church. I'm not the gossiping kind, he ensured Patrick, but so much scandal has occurred in this ward around those pastors. With a sly smile and a wink for Patrick, he continued, So let me not tell you what happened. The very first minister, named Henry Herbert, died when he was returning on Oglethorpe's favorite ship, the Anne. He was heading back to England, and his merciful God struck him down for reasons unsuspected. Then they had Mr. Quincy stand a short tenure till the third pastor arrived. His name was John Wesley, and lad, let me tell you this scandalous tale. <laughs> the wig man laughed. Well, the beautiful Sophia Hopke was to be married, but a misunderstanding and a folly caused Pastor Wesley to refuse to publish her bans of marriage in the church. Therefore, she ran over to South Carolina in disgrace and got her nuptials done there. Pastor Wesley was made a fool by this and refused the new couple communion when they returned. Such a public insult this was that Sophia's husband sued the pastor for defamation. Have you ever heard of such a thing, suing a man of God? The resulting in embarrassing controversy caused such an uproar in the parish that they asked him to return to England in 37. Funny thing is, a man told me he is starting some new Methodist church in England that's already wildly popular. Oh, those religious folks and their stories make me laugh. <laughs> As Archibald collected himself from his laughter, he changed the subject and suggested... Let's turn up this street until we run into Heathcote Ward. The men slowly walked on, with Archibald continuing to point out the sights and characters of Savannah. This ward is named for George Heathcote. I know, not very original. He is also one of the trustees. Although Savannah preaches the merits of equality, this is where the high society resides. The square we're walking by is called St. James, and at night home to some wonderful music and arts. My favorite wandering bard sings here. His name is Wes Lopper. We must remember to try to catch him one night. I'm sure you'll enjoy him very much. Rumors also bound that a troop of actors might come and perform here in the square. Patrick could only nod. So much information of his new hometown was beginning to overwhelm him, but Archie Ball continued on. Well, let's make our way to Percival Ward. This Warden Square is named after Vincent Percival. <laughs> Again, I know the founders are not very creative with their names. Archibald cracked. This is Jew territory and where the ladies of pleasure reside. There's not supposed to be any Jews here at all, but that Dr. Nunes, the man who purchased the services of your Goliath friend, he is the common man's town doctor and is one favor for his kind. If you have bags of silver and are the proper social class, you can get an appointment with Dr. Telfair. But he would never be seen with the likes of us. It took no time to break that no Jew law because the second boat to land had 42 Jews on it. Oglethorpe and the trustees never made them leave because the Jews were refugees from Spain and Portugal. 
they had sympathy for their plight. The trustees then decided to only ban Roman Catholics in fear of them assisting the damned Spaniards that keep attacking outside of this town. Archibald then straightened his shirt and spoke as if he was very serious, but a faint smile could be seen on his lips. As far as whores go, well, officially, there are none here. The upstanding church-going wives would have seen them in stocks, of course, but all the men deny they are here. To know the truth, one just needs to look at all the soldiers and sailors in town. Of course, any military attracts whores like honey to bees. As if on cue, two of Patrick's former crewmates then stumbled out of a house. A woman in a worn red dress unceremoniously shoved them out the back entrance. She then escorted them out and exchanged gazes with Patrick. A warm, inviting smile beamed from her as she waved her handkerchief at the two blacksmiths. She then hiked up her dress, revealing a tattooed ankle, slipping a silver round down the side of her red shoe. She slowly sashayed her backside left to right, left to right, left to right, smiling over her shoulder, giving the blacksmiths an eyeful of motion. At the door, she blew a gentle kiss to Patrick before returning to her duties. Patrick immediately felt his desire swelling in his pants. Such a blatant display of sexuality after weeks on a ship and years in a prison cell overwhelmed him. Archibald smiled at the younger man. Ah, lad, that is the mysterious April Sky. I know, it is an odd name. I've never heard someone named after a month, but I'm fairly certain it is not the name she was christened with. With that stated, April Skye is the most powerful madam in all of Savannah, and no woman dares whore without her blessing or paying her homage. She is the scourge of Savannah's popular women, but the men do really love her girls, so she is left to her craft unmolested. The rumor is she used to run the seas with pirates before all the pirates were hunted down and killed. I am told every inch of her body except her face is covered with tattoos. It is said she's highly superstitious and uses them to ward off the devil. Archibald then warned, If you want to keep your temple pure, you best stay away from that harlot. Patting Patrick's shoulder, Archibald announced, Well, that sex parade is over. Come along. There are two other wards under construction I need to show you. The two men recommenced their journey with Freeman pointing out the sights. Over that way is the Upper New Square. The other one over that way is one that they have not decided to name yet. <laughs> I reckon they must have run out of honorable trustees to bestow the honor on. Archibald poked Patrick in the ribs. Savannah is growing so fast, it seems that they move the bloody palisades outward every week. Let us walk this way toward the river. Mr. Freeman instructed, and I will show you the exotic plants over at the trustee's garden. The men wandered to the bluff and came across a garden adorned with a small house. This is Oglethorpe's pride and joy, the trustee's garden. It is said to be modeled after the Chelsea Botanical Garden in London. The mental bastard spent a king's ransom having plants delivered to him from all four corners of the world. All sort of exotic plant were first soiled here, but the first frost killed most of them. There was apple, pear, olive, fig, coffee trees, and cotton. Bamboo plants, indigo, coconut palms, hemp, oranges, and many various herbs to assist a doctor. The money crop was intended to be mulberry trees for silkworms. Oglethorpe dreamed he could use them to feed silkworm and spin silk. The garden used to be well tended when Francis Moore was here, but now it's falling apart quickly into disarray. This is typical of anything government owned, Archibald spit. No one's ever held accountable, and anything the king touches goes to piss. You'd never see a farmer let his own land go this way. It's a damn shame. Freeman looked longingly at the failing garden and shaking his head silently with disgust. What's that mound of rocks in the middle of the garden for? Patrick inquired. That is a pyramid burial ground for one of those Yamacraw savages, Archibald answered. The Yamacraw locals were very helpful to Oglethorpe. In return, he respects their ways. 
He even promised the chief not to disturb any of the resting souls. Ah, Patrick mouthed with understanding. There were so many new, alien customs and strange sights. It was the only response he could muster. Archibald continued gazing upon the garden. Now all that is uh, really growing well is the oranges, apples, and the hemp. Us regular Savanians refer to this place as Oglethorpe's Folly. Now don't let any of the lobster backs hear you saying such, or you will be hanging from a gallows. That Oglethorpe does not care to be mocked. Patrick nodded earnestly. He waited to impress upon his new master he understood. Archibald could sense Patrick's seriousness, so he joked. Well, that'll be one shilling for the tour. You'll have to pay me in credit, I'm assuming. Patrick smiled, and Archibald concluded. Let us get you to the tailor now. The men went to the Broughton side of Market Square and knocked on the door of a humble house. A large-breasted maiden answered the door hastily. Her hair was disheveled, and her dress was hanging from her sweaty chest. She clutched a stuffed linen ball full of needles close to her full chest. Archibald removed his hat. Good morrow, Prudence. Is your father here? I need my friend here fitted for some work linens. She loudly cussed up. No! Those bastard brads got him working for free, mending their damn coats in their quarters. Those heavy wool red coats that were made from the company in Charlestown called South Carolina Independent Company. They make fine wear, but their buttons are always ripping off. Or their sleeves are being singed by the lamplights. Those red coats catch and they go up like a Viking funeral pyre. Prudence was visibly upset and spouted. Those arrogant bastards, making him come to them to fix their wares for gratis. Quiet, love. Your tongue is too loose for open air, Archibald hushed Prudence. I just hate those red leeches so much. I hope the bastards get cocksaws from April Sky's whores. Prudence responded with little restraint. She sighed and remembered the business at hand. What are you two locks standing around for? Well, show him in and I can get his numbers. Both men looked nervous at each other. Oh, uh, ma'am, we can't enter the domicile of a lady with no man home. Archibald nervously explained. For Lord's sake, she exclaimed. Fine, I'll do it in the yard to reassure the rest of the world that you two not be molesters. Christ! Patrick was instructed to stand on a stump while she used cords of hemp to measure. This is Patrick, our new indenture. He'll be smithing with me. He needs hemp fiber if possible, something sturdy and protective around fire, Archibald propositioned. Yes, I know how to make a bloody smithing outfit for fuck's sake. You know I'm a grown woman, she snapped. Yes, and such a refined and proper lady you grew into. <laughs> Archibald smirked. Fuck you, you damn Scottish dress-wearing drunk. I hear you Scottish brogue you're so desperately trying to conceal. She warned him. Stand still, will ya? She snapped at Patrick as she ran her hand up his seam. This is the closest a woman had ever been to his crotch, and he was instantly erect. It was so unnatural for a man of his age to be completely inexperienced in the ways of a woman. He found his impure thoughts overwhelming since the moment he landed in Savannah. Being exposed to the soft gender was wreaking havoc on his senses and concentration. He tried his hardest not to squirm on the stump. I got all I need, Prudence stated. Come back in two weeks for a final fitting and me father will figure out the silver with you. Also, I would like to come and call on Heather tonight to join Mariana and I in listening to Wes's fiddle. She half asked, half told. Archibald responded, If she's finished with her chores, I see no discourse. Mentioning Mariana, is she baking today? I smelled the heavenly cornbread in the air this morning. You best hurry. I know she's low on corn flour. Might be the last for an age, Prudence urged. Patrick pointed to a long line of redcoats at a nearby house. What is that huge line for? Ah, lad, that's the food line for the government workers. They stand in the sun for hours to get some rancid meat and rotting fruit. The first few years in the colony were the worst. I remember everyone was forced to take Oglethorpe's handouts to live on. 
The founding settlers quickly overhunted the area, and we were completely dependent on what traders brought in. They paid very little money to the local Yamacraw tribe, so the Indians only sold them the worst meat and fruit, Archibald explained. In short time, the populace discovered how poorly their needs were being handled if they trust the government to take care of them. A free market exploded very quickly, and the quality of everything got better. Still, those tied to the king, like soldiers and bureaucrats here, are completely dependent on that disgusting slop. I guess we could still get spoiled meat if we wanted to, but no self-respecting man I know would take it. Do not forget how the food is actually paid for. Silver is taken from the rest of us to pay for it. I can't take that grub in good conscience because I know the funds to buy it were stolen from my neighbors and family by redcoat threats of force. The men departed with a wave to Prudence and continued back into the square where a small covered booth was standing. The Q5 Deep was waiting to purchase warm bread. The line was intoxicating with the smell of fresh bread. A father and daughter worked behind the table and were quickly running out. The blacksmiths waited anxiously in line, hoping to buy some before they ran out. The old heavy man behind the counter barked. Your timing is that of a hawk, Mr. Freeman. We're down to our last loaf. I've always had outstanding luck, Mr. Dandridge. Archibald playfully responded. Good morrow, Mr. Freeman. Who's your companion? The daughter queried. Miss Mariana Dandridge? Let me introduce you to Patrick Willis, our new indenturee. Archibald proclaimed and then bowed. Patrick took in the beautiful young lady. Dark braided hair fell out of her cooking hood and onto her shoulders. She had a thin linen white dress and a cooking apron. She wore no gloves, but her hands were not bug welted like everyone else. Working around a fire all day kept the bugs from biting her delicate hands. Patrick bowed and formally stated, My honor, lady. My daughter in the, uh, <laughs> lady prudence, he snickered would like you to join them tonight to go hear the bard sing. If your goodly father bestows his blessings, I will escort you ladies to and fro. Yes, I grant my blessing. Those three are like molasses. Enjoy yourself escorting them, Freeman, Mr. Dandridge grumbled. Mariana then threw her arms around her smiling father and hugged him like a black bear. Changing the subject, Archibald asked, Mr. Dandridge, how did you get corn this early in the season? Mariana answered for her father. The red-skinned deer pelt traders brought it in from the south. I suppose the winter is mild enough to plant early down there. Sometimes, if they're really lucky, they get two grows out of one season. Silver was then exchanged for the bread, and the blacksmiths walked off as they split a piece of hot bread. Okay, lad, it's time to earn all this food and clothing. Let me go teach you how to make nails, the wig man said as he returned home. The men came home to an empty house, but Archibald was not alarmed. Every morning the family goes out to collect fallen wood to supply the pit. Grab some of that dried hay and that there stirring stick. They're usually hot embers still alive from last night, so reheat them with the bellows, the wigged man instructed. Patrick pumped the bellows until the embers grew orange. He then tossed some hay and kindling into the smoldering pit. With a kiss of air pumped from the bellows, flame was immediately summoned and the pit sprung to life. The men stacked some driftwood in and tended the fire until it glowed. It took a half an hour of burning wood until it got hot enough for their purposes. Here, lad, you can use my old apron and gloves, Archibald offered. They're thick buckskin and will keep you safe. Archibald then helped Patrick tie the heavy apron on. Now I've already melted some scrap metal and drawn the metal out to rods. Take this rod, heat it up until it glows orange. Archibald demonstrated. Put it deep into the embers like this. Now, pull it out quickly before it melts and bring it over to the anvil. The seasoned blacksmith began to forge and shape the glowing end of the rod into a four-sided point. He worked very quickly and then placed the nail-shaped end on the chisel sticking straight up out of the anvil. He proceeded to turn the rod over and over as he struck it against the chisel. He then took the chisel weakened section and bent it until it broke off from the long rod. He finally grabbed the glowing nail with the circular pair of pliers and inserted it into a hole in the anvil. He quickly pounded a flat head into the nail and dunked it in cool water. 
With his adroit craftsmanship, the whole process was over in less than a minute, and there sat a fine-looking nail. Patrick was impressed with the speed and skill Archibald possessed. Archibald, sensing Patrick's distress, reassured him, Don't worry, son. After a few thousand nails, you'll be just as fast. You ready to try your hand at it? To that, Patrick nodded. He worked until sundown with Archibald's close supervision. At the end of the day, there were 15 mangled mishap nails and 10 that were passable. It was hard, hot, dirty work, but at least the heat drove off the mosquitoes and the annoying, biting sand gnats. Patrick was beginning to feel confident with his vocation of pounding out nails, but when Mariana and Prudence arrived calling on Heather, Patrick smashed his thumb with his hammer. <laughs> the two girls laughed at Patrick's misfortune. Archie Ball, the veteran blacksmith, had a laugh as well. <laughs> Mind your hammer there, lad. Patrick's thumb turned almost as red as his cheeks. The elder freeman then patted his shoulder and suggested they break for supper. That day, Maximilian and Amos had caught four decent-sized fish, and Heather and Marion had readied them for cooking. The visiting ladies graciously bought a basket of fresh apples with them, and they all dined under the dogwood. After their bellies were full and good conversation was shared, the anxious young ladies prodded the wig man to escort them to St. James Square. Daddy, it's starting. Can we please go? Heather whined. Yes, my dear. He answered and then turned to his apprentice. Would you like to hear some music this evening, Mr. Willis? Patrick nodded eagerly. The three women checked their appearances, fixing each other's hair as the group started to stroll to the square. The three giggling girls held hands and walked ahead of Archibald and Patrick, making jokes the two men could not hear. If I can be so direct, Patrick boldly asked, It seems odd, sir, that three adult women are not already bounded to men and bearing children. This colony has many single men. Are they not being courted? Oh, lad, these three are the most courted women in the colonies, but they never accept any man's advances. They treat the men like toys and accept their gifts. But they seem more focused on being with each other and finding themselves in a family way. Savannah is an odd colony. I've never seen women so carefree and not bound by social graces, Patrick carefully noted. Lad, the king's military and upper-crust socialites act nothing like us working colonists. You will take a bloodcoat's rifled butt to the teeth if you do not adhere to their strict social protocol. Our friends are very careful about who and where we speak openly around, Archibald warned. So how do you know you can trust me? Patrick inquired. How come you already speak freely around and with me? Archibald stopped in the street and turned to face Patrick. His face looked grave yet sympathetic. Because you've spent some time in the king's prison, I know you must hate the government that did this to you. Patrick stopped in his tracks, and the color ran from his face. He then hung his head shamefully and muttered, It's true, Mr. Freeman. How did you know I was a convict? No free man would indenture his time so long. A free man would only do five years at most for passage. Your debt is seven years, so I reckon only a prisoner without a choice would accept those terms, Archibald reasoned. Patrick confessed. It is true. I'll tell you anything you want to know. I hate being clandestine with you. I was under mortal threat by Captain Gibbons to conceal the truth from you. Just please, sir, don't return me. There's only death for me back at sea. Archibald put a caring hand on Patrick's shoulder and began to walk. Lad, you have no worries with me. Just tell me your story and speak the truth without fear. Violin music was heard as they rounded the corner. St. James Square was now being illuminated by the setting sun. The three young ladies picked a prominent spot to be seen while listening to what they thought was German music. They perched and displayed themselves like peacocks welcoming their suitors. It did not take long either as all kinds of men strolled by and found reasons to converse with the comely young ladies. Mariana even brought a basket to carry home all the gifts the ladies would receive from hopeful men. Patrick watched Slackjaw as a line of men tried to catch the lady's fancy. Well, I guess we have time for me to tell you the true story of how I came to be here in Savannah, Patrick conceded. 
Patrick spun the heartbreaking tale and even tried to hold back the tears as the grief poured out of him. Archie Ball held his shoulder in support and concern.